testimonies, to hear the testimonies of, of souls that were saved. And it's a, kind of an interesting thing to note that the fair was uh, one of the lowest attended fairs, even though the weather was absolutely wonderful for a fair week. It wasn't super hot but uh, lower attendance, and I find that to be uh, true of many things in our generation. People are more uh, inverted, as uh, I think it was Charlie said, uh, people were walking around almost like robots, and I thought he might be saying he were walking by looking at their screens, you know, because that's what people do. They get all caught up in their own world. And as a result of that, certain, some of those things that happen in a community that really are a blessing to uh, to the life of our uh, mortality, uh, you know, they're, they're missed. They're missed out on. It's like somebody who's taking video all the time. They're always taking video. They're not involved in what's going on. In our home, we do a little thing. We, uh, when we have a fellowship, like some kind of a holiday, whether it's, you know, Christmas or Thanksgiving, everybody's there, I might take a video camera and have everybody, you know, hold it and then pass it on after a second or a camera. Just take a picture from your vantage point, you know, so they're passing it around. That way nobody's losing out on the blessing. But things are being poorly attended, things that would really make for a fuller life. And uh, it's true in churches, true in fairs, and so forth. In fact, hard times had actually hit on one monastery. They weren't really taking in enough alms and so forth, so I guess they decided that it was time for them to come up with new ideas to raise money. And so what they did was they began to uh, sell fish and chips. Fish and chips. <laughs> wow, that's kind of weird. Fish and chips. And so one day a guy was walking by, and he knocked on the monastery door, and he said, Hi, are you the fish fryer? He said, No. I'm the chip monk. <laughs> so that, you know, just so you, you have that one out of the way, <laughs> you'll, you'll think about that. It'll keep giving as you, <laughs> I'm the chip monk. All right, so we got that out of the way. I had to do that quickly because we've eaten into some of my preaching time here this morning. So, but it is true. There are things that are harder and harder. I was listening to a radio broadcast this past week, and I heard... Uh, the one who was on the radio say, you know, we have these big conferences. They're very well attended across the country. However, most of the people who are attending are above 50 years old. You know, it's getting to the place where the new generation is losing their interest in the things of God or uh, their ability maybe to connect in the real, we in the real world with real life day-to-day -day things. Uh, and so what I want to do is I want you to go with me to the book of Isaiah this morning, and I want to talk to you again about something we talked about last week. We talked about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That passage was in Romans 10, but it was a reference Paul was making to Isaiah 52. And I thought at the end of this week of having the opportunity to be at the fair and share the Lord, uh, we might revisit the moorings of that verse and glean some things. And, and I didn't realize what we were going to be into so much, but I think it's very powerful to do uh, this passage in light of our day. You see, we live in a day where people do not understand the plot. When I say we miss the plot or lose the plot sometimes, uh, realize something. God has a plan that has been in place from the very beginning. And that plan will be fulfilled. And everything that he said will come into its own. And Jesus, when he was here, uh, amplified that plan. He constantly was talking about that plan. He even told us when we pray that we're supposed to pray over that plan. And when he did it, he did it by saying this, you're to pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What? Thy kingdom come. <laughs> Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He, he wants us to be praying for the kingdom to come, and it will come. The Bible even tells us, he who shall, will come shall come, and he won't tarry. And so when we come to this passage before us in Isaiah 52, I want you to realize that there is this plan that is on the agenda that really does have a lot to do with our uh, proclamation, if you will, our publishing of peace. And if you look at chapter 52 and verse 7, the Bible says, how beautiful upon the mountains are, are the feet of them, of him that brings good news, uh, that publishes peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation. So publishing peace and publishing salvation are seemingly here 
to be one in the same realities. He says, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Now, that, in its own right, begins to put, that, that letter last, that ending phrase, begins to put a little finer point on it. You see, God in his awesomeness created a perfect world, but we, in our foolishness, frittered it away. And after that happened, there came a time upon the earth where, in fact, uh, people were of necessity going to have to live in a different kind of a world. It would be hostile to them. The devil would be the god of this world. And the sin nature was aflame with lusts and passions and, and covetousness and hatred and bitternesses and, and all of the things that well up in the heart of men. Jesus said, out of the heart proceeds murders, adulteries, fornication, all of the things that defile us. He said, that's going to be a wild card in our midst. We're going to be in a fallen world. It's because not only would you have the devil afoot, not only would you have a war battle going on inside, but everybody around us would have the battle going on inside them. So what the difference would be is now we would not walk by sight. We would have to walk by faith. So God pulls out Abraham and he puts him into play. And Abraham believed God. It was imputed to him for righteousness. He brings forth uh, a son in his old age, miraculously so, for his wife was past the age of childbearing. And so when they got that child, because it was such a laughable ordeal, Isaac was born. They named him Isaac, which name means laughter, <laughs> because God did something pretty remarkable. But Isaac begot Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Now we have the people of Israel, and this passage is all about Israel. Israel fumbled the ball. They were supposed to be the people throughout the Old Testament who, get, who helped people realize what it meant to actually live by faith. They were to pick up the faith that was passed on to them through Abraham. A few did. At first, more than a few, but then a few, and then fewer and fewer. And sometimes there were times when you didn't even know if anybody in the room really understood what it was to be a man or a woman of faith. It's a kind of an interesting uh, point to put in here that when you go through the book of Judges, it got so bad, the Bible says every man did that which was right in their own eyes. They weren't looking to God. They were looking at their own devices and thinking, what do I think is right? What do I think is wrong? But then you interject in that very same time frame the book of Ruth where there was a man named Boaz, a righteous man who became a kinsman redeemer, emblematic of our Christ, who is our redeemer. He loves us and he gave himself for us. But uh, this kinsman redeemer is right there in the smack dab in the midst of that black time on the, on the pages of human history. What I'm saying is, is that Israel was God's people who were supposed to keep alive the reality that things were different now. We were going to have to walk by faith and not by sight. We saw last week when we were in Romans chapter 10 that God had given the people of Israel the word of faith. And that was the whole concept of that passage. There was a word of faith. And in our day, people pick up that phrase, the word of faith, and they think it means name it, claim it. They think it means prosperity. They think it means if you will believe it, it will be true. And it is not what it's saying. If you go to Romans 10, you'll find out the word of faith is nigh unto you. It's even in your mouth that whosoever shall believe on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. That's the word of faith. That we need to believe. We need to have faith. We have to have faith in Christ. That is the word of faith as defined in Romans 10. But when you come to chapter 52, which he draws from when he's making his point about the, the need to send people out to preach the gospel, to preach the good news, he takes it from this passage and he says, uh, he, he's actually ta talking from a, a context in this passage of bringing peace back to Israel. Somehow that they would understand salvation. Those who were his people, God's people, had lost the plot so badly that there would have to come a day when, in fact, peace would be proclaimed to them. Now, we know that that's future tense. We know that that's along, uh, along the way when we get into the tribulation, they're going to receive an antichrist who they're going to think is kind of messianic in his own way. He's going to make everything right, put Israel back in their place, but... He will break his covenant after the middle of the tribulation. And then, uh, of course, he will begin to persecute those who will not uh, come to heal, who will not bow the knee, who will not let him be proclaimed as God, as he will insist uh, must be done. 
So when he comes and he, when we come to this chapter, we see some things that are very profound. Look at the first words of verse 1. It says, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come in unto thee uh, the uncircumcised and unclean. What he's saying to them is that they need to awake. It reminds us of those words in Ezekiel where the Bible says of, of the Lord speaking to Ezekiel. He says, son of man, what do you see? He looks out in a valley. He says, I see dry bones. <laughs> I see dry bones. He says, can these bones live, Ezekiel? He says, thou knowest. He says, speak to the wind, speak to them. And suddenly there was the thigh bone connecting to the hip bone and so forth. It's the old hymn, uh, old uh, God. I think it was the black spiritual uh, spiritual songs of the slaves of yore. They would sing this stuff and they would say, could these bones live? And as they began to come together, the flesh and the sinew began to come upon the bodies of, of a mighty army. And that was the resurrection of Israel. He said, listen, I know you're at a place now, Ezekiel, where things are so bad. And they've been that way for a long time. But these bones shall live. This reminds us of that. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. And he's telling them that they need to uh, put on strength. And he says, put on strength and put on beautiful garments. Both are the same thing. The word for beautiful garments has the idea of them cooperating uh, for the first time with the judgments that God is going to pour out. The idea of garments has the idea of covering. It has the idea of that which is pillaging, too. It has the idea that they are supposed to put on their proper role. One of the things we don't realize is that there's going to be a physical, literal kingdom, political kingdom. And what we have to remember is, is that this is not that. There would never be a time when America would bring in that kingdom. I really enjoyed listening to D. James Kennedy many years ago when he was still living. And he would always talk very loftily about the founding of our country. And he would be all about the, the, the histories and the, and the biblical principles of salvation. In fact, he gives us the, uh, the E.E. track that we enjoy so well that sets forth the gospel in such a clear way. However, D. James Kennedy believed in a, a millennium that was going to be earthly, that we were going to bring in and we were going to get the world better. And so much of his efforts were bent toward trying to reform the society. It's not going to happen. The Bible says the wicked shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that what's going to happen is at the end, when it's almost like there's not even any faith on the earth, the rapture is going to happen and Jesus is going to come after the tribulation. What I'm saying to you is, is that this is that. Awake, awake. God's going to use the tribulation, which is also called the time of Jacob's trouble. He's going to shake them awake. He's going to wake up, wake up. <laughs> Why? Because God, God never fails. And because He never fails, He didn't fail with Israel either. Do you know God is known either through our judgments or through our blessings? If you can go through life, even if you are become, to become a martyr one day, uh, you can go in with the joy of the Lord as your strength. He will give you what you need. Many years ago, I think it was back about right around 1990, I spent six days in jail for the rescue movement. My heart was moved. I, I was sitting in front of a, an abortion clinic. Thirty-five babies typically were killed daily at this particular abortion mill. I sat down outside peaceably praying, asking God to forgive us, and they arrested us, and they put us in jail for six days. While I was in there, I had the privilege of leading a guy to the Lord. While I was in there, I had no Bible. Somebody got me a Bible. While I was in there, I began to talk to my Catholic friend who was in there who needed Jesus and began to explain to him. And they asked me to preach to all the other Catholics. They even gave me the Magnificent that is uh, Mary's uh, enunciation of how wonderful it was to be, uh, you know, uh, the, the one chosen to bring forth the Son of God. And man, I was just preaching Jesus in there every day. <laughs> The Bible says, praise be unto God who always leads us into triumph. You see, you will, have, you will be like a fruitful vine. You will have the joy of the Lord. You will have the buoyancy that comes from God being in the details of your life. Or you can go through life as a, a, as a you know, kind of an example of judgment, of not doing what you know to do, and you're going to bump along all the way to heaven. 
This is what Israel's done. They've become an, an illustration of God's power and His goodness through judgment. God has placed them on the shelf, but they're not out of the game. They're just on the shelf. Because they haven't believed. But one day they will see Him whom they pierced, and they will mourn for Him as for an only son. And they will be restored. And this is that. He says, awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. They had strength. And you and I have strength today. And we need to put on our strength. And he says, put on your beautiful garments. Make the right judgments. Make the right decisions. Do use your discernment and discretion. And he has shown you what is required of you. Love mercy. Uh, do justly. Walk humbly with your God. That's all he requires of us. Because you and I are called to live in a way on this earth that reflects the walk of faith. It reflects the word of faith. It reflects that God has ordained that men must walk by faith. Said three times in the scriptures, the just shall live by faith. Now the only way that God could, get, could, could kind of get that message out was by taking a whole nation in the Old Testament. And the way he's getting it out now is by taking individuals. You see, they had a political vehicle through which to get that word to the nations. They had everything they did was done by faith. They, many of them didn't even know why they did it. They just did it because they were told to do it. You and I have this treasure in earthen vessels, you see. They had a political vehicle, but we have an earthen vessel. And we go everywhere we go living by faith. And if we walk with Him and we know Him, we will either let it be known among those who watch our lives through our judgments or through, uh, uh, or through our judgment. Okay, So we have to be a people uh, who understand that we have strength in the Lord in, when we walk by faith. It says in the Bible, in the in, in, in book of Proverbs, it says, Lean not on your own understanding. Right? Uh, commit your way unto the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. One translation says smooth. He will make it smooth. He will smooth things out for you. And the Bible says in this passage that He wants from henceforth for them to know that there shall no more come in unto the, the, the uncircumcised and the unclean. Now, he's not talking about a, 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 a kind of a caste system. He's talking about uncircumcised spiritually, the heart being uncircumcised. He says, you're not going to have people in your midst in Israel anymore who are people who don't get it. Because it will be clearer than a bell for them. You know, it's interesting. All in the Old Testament, up to the time of Jesus, they thought they were going to have a kingdom. And they were right. But they missed their king. They didn't let him be king. They began to tell him what they needed him to do. Deliver us from Rome. Make us the head and no longer the tail. Put us on top and everybody else on bottom. And because he wouldn't get in lockstep with him, the Pharisees hated him because he was suggesting some things that would have deposed them from their positions of influence and power. And so they nailed him to a cross and they killed him. But nevertheless, he said it had to be so. He said, for this reason I came into the world. And he died on the cross to pay for our sins that we might be given life. And the Jewish people, as it were, had a darkness fall over their minds. But what a beautiful thing to remember this little detail. That when Jesus was on the cross and hanging there naked, and having been ripped and torn by a cat of nine tails, and dying and gasping for breath, and sweating, as it were, with the blood coming down from his crown of thorns, here he is praying this prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, when Jesus asks that, you know the Father's leading in. And within 50 days, you have the, uh, the day of Pentecost dawning, and what happens there is 3,000 get saved. They're hearing him say, you took him and you crucified him. And they say, what must we do to be saved? And they got saved. 3,000 of those very people who shouted crucify him. God in his awesomeness was able to say, I forgive you. I forgive you. 3,000 got saved. Later, 5,000. And then a great multitude. But as time went on, they began to deal with the nuts and bolts reality. And as times peaked... Then they began to diminish, and as time has gone on, we see that that great darkness has fallen on Israel. And God is saying, you've fallen asleep. You've lost the plot. He says, wake up. Wake up. He says, there's not going to be, when, it time, when this time comes, there's not going to be any more of this, uh, these people who don't have a tender heart, who don't understand what's right and what's wrong. 
The word unclean has the idea of infamy in Ezekiel 22.5 where Ezekiel lays them out. He says, you guys have had an infamous name. You've had an infamous name. And he says, you're not going to have any more uncircumcision uh, of heart. You're not going to have any more infamy. Do you know the whole Old Testament is a catalog of their infamous behaviors? Parting the Red Sea and then complaining that they're hungry. Getting food and complaining about it every day. They get this manna and then they're complaining about it and giving them, and they say, we want meat. Uh, going along and saying, we need water. And God, where are you? And Moses, why? who made you in charge? And all of the things, bump, 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 bump. Getting to the Jordan River and saying, we're not going in. They're too big and too bad. We can't do it. They would not walk by faith. And so sub subsequently, they weren't to be known by their judgment, which was a walk of faith, but they were to be known by their judgments. And for 40 years, the nations around them would watch them wandering around. They'd see the pillar of fire. They'd see the cloud. They'd see the manna every morning. They'd spy it out and say, what are they doing? Just walking around. <laughs> it's like a video game back in the day when they were really simple. You remember that Pac-Man game, that little thing going around? He'd get in one corner. He'd go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. For 40 years, these guys went back and forth in the wilderness. Get this, the wilderness of sin. Does it sound like American church today? Sometimes we just don't really show the gospel. We don't show the Christ. We don't show the walk of faith. We're living like the world. Verse 2 says, shake thyself from the dust. The idea here is very powerful. It's like as a, as a lion rustles out its mane. He says, shake off the dust. Come up out of the dust. That's why I say it reminds us of the dry bones. He says, rise, sit down, O Jerusalem. In other words, set yourself where you were always supposed to be. Because he's going to establish a physical, political kingdom on the earth in which Jesus Christ will be king and he will rule and reign from, uh, with a rod of iron. He says, loose thyself from thy bands, of the bands of thy neck, in verse 2, O captive daughter of Zion. Do you think any of the Christians today are captives? Do you think any of them need to break the bonds that the devil has gotten them in? Do you think maybe that the church today has lost its way, not reflecting Christ, but beginning to just sell out for all the wrong reasons? He says, break, he says, loose yourself from your bands. Do you know what is really cool is that you can. You can. You can loose yourself from your bands. You do it by faith. You believe what God says. You're dead to sin. You're free from sin. If you're listening to sin, it's because you've chosen to, not because you have to. He says, set yourself free. He says, from your bands. Look what it says. He says, you've sold yourself, verse 3, for nothing. You've sold yourself for nothing. And you shall be redeemed without money. I love the second half of that verse. <laughs> He says, he says, you sold for nothing. Did you know the word pornea, which we get porno from? It has the idea of to sell like yourself. It was actually connected to prostitution. And you know, when people get caught up in all of that, what they're doing is they're selling themselves for nothing. They're selling themselves. They're giving it up. They're saying, I, I, I'm laying down. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to do battle. And if I'm a Christian and I get caught up in that stuff, I'm saying, I'm, going to get, I'm just going to give it up. I'm just going to sell myself for nothing. He says, but I will redeem you without money. What a powerful thing. That he will redeem us with blood because blood was what was shed because we didn't do what we should have done. And it took blood. Do you realize the reason Jesus died was because we were under a death penalty? That's what it was. Everything we did, every solicitation we made to the world, every time we tried to bring somebody else into the circle of our sin, we were blood guilty. We were under the death penalty. I've told the story often about a girl I went to school with. I talked her into getting uh, high on pot the first time. She was one of the sweetest girls, and she would just, was, you know, big heart, you know. And me, the little deceiver that I was at that time, just talked her into it. The next thing you know, she's going out with the biggest druggie in the, in the city, he, doing a lot of LSD, and she's, her clothing changed, her, dement, her, her disposition changed. And as time went on, I got right with the Lord, God forgave me, but I ran into her at the store, and she says, God, D shouted it right out in the middle of the store. Is that you, Dave? 
And that was my fault. And to this day, that girl does not know the Lord. She's got herself back righted to the middle of the road again, and she's a good mom, as I understand, but she's caught up in the world's narrative. Do you realize how culpable each of us are? And if he took the blood that you and I deserve uh, to shed and he reckoned it to you and me, it would be right, it would be true, it would be proper, it would be appropriate, it would be exactly what we deserve. But he redeemed us without money. He redeemed us with the same thing that was required of us. He redeemed us with the blood of the Lamb. Now these people knew it all along in their kind of backstory of their mind. You saw in your bulletin, I hope, this morning, and you should read these. These are really great pictures and so forth. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, For now we see uh, through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then shall I know, even as I also am known. You see, the reality is, is that's the way the Israelites, they only had the darkly. They didn't know very clearly as time dawned and Jesus came and Paul began as a great rabbi to understand the Old Testament. He began to lay it out in a way that was just so powerful. He says, listen, the publishing of peace was something that was supposed to go on, but you need to wake up. You need to shake out your mane. You need to gird yourself with your beauty. You need to quit being uh, judged and start getting in some judgment. Start putting on your mind and saying, this is what I'm here for. It's not for nothing we're here. We need to represent our King. The Bible says in verse 4, For thus says the Lord God, My people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there. And the Assyrian oppressed them without a cause. That's exactly what's going on in our day to day. The church is interjected into the world, which Egypt is a symbol of the world, but it was a real place. Don't get me wrong. It was a real place. God planned for a famine, sent Joseph ahead to pray the, uh, prepare the way. Subsequently, they went down there. They were supposed to have a great influence on Egypt. But as time went on, Egypt turned dark, and they began to forget Joseph, and they began to oppress the people of God. And so God delivered him with a mighty hand, taking vengeance on all ten of their primary gods, each one of the plagues having a special interest in each of the gods that the Egyptians worshipped. And God foiled them all, brought them out with a great hand, split the Red Sea, put them on, their, on the wings of an eagle, and took them out. And subsequently, God says, this is you, you and me. We are the people of God in Egypt today. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. We're supposed to be showing them the great deliverances that he brings. The buoyancy, as Michelle said. Man, I was discouraged. And I asked God to encourage me. Guess what he did? He encouraged her. You're going to need some encouragement along the, way, along the way. And God is in the encouraging business. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says, Blessed be the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions, that we may be able to comfort others with the same comfort we ourselves are comforted of God with. Aren't you so glad he's personal? Doesn't matter who you are, where you are. God says, I know you. And so he says this, you used to be, he says, Israel used to be in Egypt. And I say to you, you and I have been interjected into the world. And when we don't necessarily find ourselves being very influential, God will move us out of the bad places. And he'll put us into the good places. But he says, but when they were in their own land, the Assyrian oppressed them without a cause. The Assyrians were way far away from Israel. And yet they come out of nowhere and they wipe out the Israelites, the northern kingdom, because God wouldn't be known by their judgments. He would be known through their judgment. And the Assyrians were the ones who came and began to oppress. And he says, that's the world you're living in today. They are a place of the, they are actually the seat of all idolatry. And in our day, what we find is that the world in which we live, those of us who know the Lord Jesus, we're on the run today. We're on the run today. Guys, this is not going to get any better. I don't know if I mentioned it here. I've shown a few of you the picture, but there's a new video game coming out. I think it's called Far Cry, number five or something like that. The picture on the, on the uh, PS3, uh, PlayStation 3 or PlayStation 4 website is of a man who's got his hair pulled back in a tight bun. He's got a, uh, he's got a, um, a, a, you know, one of these Fu Manchu type things, like I got kind of thing. But he's, he's all harsh. He's got guns on the, on the, on the table, and there's all these people. It's a picture of the Last Supper. 
And they got a man down here in the front, and he's got the word sinner scrawled on his back. He's got his hands bound. They've got a church in the background. And they're making the bad guys in this new video game for our young people to play to be the Christians. The, the Christians who've taken guns and taken arms, and they're going to be having to be killed. they got a preacher whose, how, whose church has been bur- burnt to the ground, uh, scorched and broken down walls, and he gets up after he's praying such a very powerful prayer. It was a, it was a trailer on their website. I watched it, and it was like, here they are. He's like, oh, Lord, I don't know what to do. And then he, and he says, I'm going to take my gun and go get the wolves. And this is what they're teaching our young people through their games. You've heard this, Right? Life imitates art. And as it comes down to it, our world's getting more and more hostile to those that are walking by faith. That's what happened. The Assyrians oppressed without a cause. He says, now therefore, verse 5, what have I here? <laughs> Say the Lord. What, what have I here? He's looking at the table, you know. Israel's in the dark. He says, wake up. He says, you need to wake and shake yourselves and put on your beautiful garments. But he says, what have I here, said the Lord, that my people is taken away for nothing. He says, you've sold yourself for nothing. They're taken away for nothing. They get nothing in return. Do you know that in Christ are given unto us all things pertaining to life and godliness? That the Bible teaches that all things are yours. That there's coming a day when everlasting joy will be upon your brow. When all of the nastiness of this world will fade into nothingness. And in His presence we'll have fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Whatever we sell out for right now, it's nothing compared to who He is and what He has, a, has a, a prepared for us. The Bible says, My people is taken for naught or nothing. They that rule over them make them howl, saith the Lord. This reminds us of David. He says, When I was silent, my bones dried up. My vitality dried up. He says, I was under the oppression of having gone after Bathsheba. I was under the oppression of having put to death by, uh, by, by conspiracy Uriah, her husband. I was under that distancing from God, but I knew him, and I knew he knew me. Guys, listen, don't ever lose sight of the fact that he knows you. Because the world in which you live would squeeze you into its mold. The devil himself would, dis, it would neutralize you in the best of ways. He would figure out exactly what it took. He says, they that rule over them make them howl. Whatever it is that we need to shake the bond off, which uh, is, is, is keeping us in bonds, we can do it. We can walk away. He's redeemed us without money. It says, he says, the, the, the they that rule over them, make them to howl, saith the Lord. And my name continually, every day, is blasphemed. When you go into your places of work, do people still blaspheme the Lord when you're standing there? Now, you can't make them not do it by a frontal assault, but you can say, you know what, I love the Lord. Anytime you get a chance to brag on the Lord Jesus, bring Him up. Just talk about him like he's your best friend. Because guess what? If you're saved, he is. You bring him into the discussion and you'll start seeing him curb that F word. You'll start seeing him curb that that taking of the Lord's name in vain. Or you'll start seeing him say, oh, sorry about that. When you're standing there, he says, my name is blasphemed every day. Why? Because the people of God have fallen asleep. The people of God have been in bonds. The people of God have not been representing He says in verse 6, after he says they've been blaspheming his name every day because the people of God haven't been getting it going on, he says, therefore, my people shall know my name. I have determined they will know my name. They will know it by judgment or they will know it by their own judgments because they're making good ones. He says, they shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. Do you know even in judgment, God is speaking to the world? While they're walking around in the wilderness for 40 years, God was speaking to the nations. He was saying, you see them, but see my pillar, see my cloud, see my manna, see the water in the rock. You see some of these cool things that happened in the midst of those people? Yeah, but we don't get it. Why are they running around? Ah, that's another thing. You keep leaning in, you find the right person, you ask them, they'll tell you. 
When the time for judgment came, it was Jeremiah or Isaiah, I think it was Jeremiah, who told the uh, prophets that were under him, that were being tutored by him, he said, you go to Assyria, you go to this place, you go to that place, call Moab, call these people, come to the mountains, look, I'm going to judge my people. You need to know this is who I am, because if he won't be known by your judgments, he will be known by your judgment. And I think that's something for us to take a, a note of from Israel's experience. And he says, they will know in that day that I am he that doth speak and have been speaking all along. It is kind of a participle here in many translations that I am he that is speaking. Behold, it is I. You see, God would have us walk by faith. Faith is not unsubstantial. It is absolutely substantial. It is substantiated on all of the evidence that we have. He says, go dig here and you'll find this. Go uh, assess that and you'll find this. He gives us all that we need to be able to stand on our own two feet. Now look what he says in verse 7, because what we were seeing there was the call to peace. He says, people, wake up. He says, people, shake it off. He's saying, call to peace. Now he's showing us the cause of peace. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. You see how powerful that is? He goes on to say, that that bringeth good tidings uh, of good, that publisheth salvation. That saith in Zion, thy God reigneth. This verse is the embodiment of what will happen after the tribulation while Israelites are hiding in nooks and crannies, hiding out from the persecution that the Antichrist will unleash upon them when he sits himself in the temple, declares himself to be God, and they realize this guy is not who we thought he was. They're going to be on the run. You may recall when Jesus takes the nations and separates them as goats from the sheep, he sets the goats on his left hand and the sheep on his right, tells the sheep on his right, enter into the kingdom, physical, political kingdom I prepared for you before the foundation of the earth. He's going to say to those on his left, depart from me. He's going to say, into everlasting darkness where you'll be pain and gnashing of teeth forever. Why? Because when I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. Those are physical needs of Jews who are going to be chased. It's going to be like the diary of Anne Frank. It's going to be like the story of the hiding place all over again. But it's going to be in a a, a global fashion. And people who have pity upon those Jewish people, because God will use their judgments to get their attention. Multitudes will be saved in the tribulation, we're told in Revelation chapter 7. But those people who are saved are going to suffer greatly. Because part of what they're going to do is they're going to be scorched, they're going to be thirsty. At the end of chapter 7 of Revelation, it says they're going to follow the Lamb wherever He goes because He's going to be here. And they're going to be tribulation saints. And they're going to say, whatever He's doing, I want to see it because He redeemed me. And He says He will lead them into pleasant places and give them the soothing of their wounds. This passage says, Blessed are those who publish good tidings of salvation. That's you and me, by the way. Do you remember when the Bible talks about those wheat and the tares? And they say, should we go rip up the tares? They say, no, let them grow together till the end of the world. What happens? He says, no, don't do that. If you tear up the tares, you're going to make up some of the wheat fall. He says, we'll wait till the end of the earth. End of time. Then we'll send forth my angels. Angels will go. Perhaps saints of God who have been glorified and come back as the bride of Christ will go. And we'll say, come on out of there. We know you're in there. Come on out. It's good. Uh, Your king reigns. He's home. He's here. He's on the ground. And you, you are home now. This book says there's a culmination. Thy king reigneth. Thy God reigneth. The Bible says in verse 8, the watchman shall lift up the voice. Can you see people? When I was a kid, we used to smoke in the boys' room. I know, it's hard to believe, right? One guy would stand over at the door like this, and he'd have his foot up like this. If he put his foot down, we need to throw the cigarettes in the, in the urinal. Teacher's coming. You know, when they're hiding out, they're going to have a watchman everywhere. They're looking out for the Antichrist and his minions. The Bible says, your watchman shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. (laughs) He's reigning. He's here. It's okay. You can come out now. Let it go in. 
This book is powerful. This truth is imminent. We're right there. He says in verse 9, Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted His people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. They're back since 1948, but they've never been awake. They've never shaken off their bonds, but they will. Everything's ready. The ball is on the tee. Right now there's a scandal for Netanyahu. They're trying to take him down with fake news. This stuff is on the agenda. They're trying to take down Donald Trump. The powers of darkness are blowing gaskets on every front. And if God just raptures us out right now, guess what happens? The floodgates blow loose. I'm excited about that in one sense. The Bible says in verse 10, The Lord hath made bare His holy arm. That's Jesus. He's the right hand of the Father. He is the Father's right hand. And He is laid bare to Israel. They're going to see Him whom they pierce. They're going to mourn for Him as for an only Son. This is who He is. And the Bible says they're now going to get it. The Lord hath made bare His holy arm in the eyes of all nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Jesus is the Savior. He is the embodiment of of salvation. All the nations throughout history since He's been here and gone have honored and known of His presence, have known of His presence. They've seen it, but not always understood it because the church, quote-unquote, churchianity or Christendom got in the way. You have crusades by those who didn't know Jesus at all. You have people, you know, putting people to death. You even have the, the Protestant Reformation guilty of blood shedding. Uh, Calvin and, and Luther uh, applauding anti-Semitism and, 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 and uh, drowning of people who were uh, Baptists, who believed you needed to get saved and then get baptized. So they would baptize them again when they came out of the, out of the Romanism that had permeated their day and the wickedness of that. Listen to me, this is powerful stuff. The Bible says they're not going to understand what they've seen, but they will have all seen it. But now they, all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. Why? Because He will come. And they will see a kingdom, a political, physical kingdom. It will last 1,000 years. That the word 1,000 years is six times mentioned in Revelation chapter 28. And, and it says 1,000 years, 1,000 years, 1,000 years. It's going to be a physical, literal 1,000 years. He can't make it any more clear than that. And so we've seen the call to peace. Uh, we've seen the cause of peace because salvation has been brought. The arm of the Lord has been revealed and He's made it possible. And now at the end here, what we're going to see, and I, I, I should probably throw in this, verse 10, uh, 11 talks about, Depart ye out of the midst of her, touch no unclean thing. This is all pictured in Revelation 18, where it says, Come out of the midst of Babylon, my people, and, and, and render unto her double according to all she's done unto you. Verse 12 does say, however, uh, the, 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 the king of peace uh, is revealed. It, it reveals the king of peace. Verse 12 says, For you shall not go out without, with haste, nor go by flight. In other words, when this happens, everything will have been done for you. <laughs> you won't have to do anything that is going to be hasty because Jesus will be your rear guard, which is at the end of verse 12. He says, you won't have to go out by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel be, will be your rear guard, which is what that word means. He will be before you and behind you. And that's why I say angels and saints are probably the ones who are going to make sure they make it home all right. If you read the last chapters of Isaiah, you will find out that the actual Gentile nations will be picking up stones out of the way as they go on the paths that are smooth. In other words, they're going to say, come on, come on, you guys are the honored guests. God wants you. He's, he's got an appointment with you down here. And all the Jews are going to go back to their place. They're going to see him whom they pierced. And they're going to be all on board because everything will click. They will be like Apostle Paul was all those years. He was willing to die. For the first time, Israel will be willing to live for Jesus. He says that you will go out. You will not go out with haste nor go by flight, for God will be your rear guard. He'll be before you and behind you. In verse 13 it says, Behold, my servant, and that's Jesus, shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And the whole world's going to talk well of Jesus. They're not going to take His name in vain anymore. 
The whole world will come to heal and they'll say, this is better than I could have possibly imagined. The people who bore the brunt of enduring to the end of the tribulation because they were walking by faith, unwilling to take a mark of the beast, these people are going to be extolling Jesus. He'll be held in high regard. And the Bible says in verse 14, as many uh, were astonished at him or astonished at the, his visage was so marred, more than any man, so, uh, and his form more than the sons of men. Do you, do you realize what an, uh, an astonishment this is? They shoved a crown of thorns on the king of peace's head. They slapped him and they punched him and they yanked out his beard and they mocked him and they hit him with a cat of nine tails and he took it all. And the world will be astonished because they're going to see him in his glory and they're going to say, really? Really? May I say to you, really? That's what he did. He did it for you and for me so we could shake off the bond. did it for you and me so that we could be those who show judgments that are sound judgments in the crises we find ourselves in. So we wouldn't have to be known by judgment but by our judgments. The Bible says His form was marred more than any of the sons of men. And it says in verse 15, So shall He sprinkle many nations. The word sprinkle is interesting to me always because there's a whole host of Christendom that likes to sprinkle and pour, and the Bible in baptism means to be immersed. And so the picture's befuddled by the word, but when you take one man and you sprinkle all the nations, think about that. The blood of one man sprinkling nations. The picture is profound. His blood is efficacious, effectual, Powerful, He is able to save. And none of us is getting out alive. We say it all the time, but it is nevertheless true. And He sprinkles all who will come to Him. Look at this. It says, So shall He sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at Him. Look at this. For that which hath not been told them, they shall see. Christendom confused the picture. Christendom today is confusing the picture. Years ago, Dr. Vance Havner used to say the world is so churchy and the church is so worldly, you can't tell the difference. I just want to go on record as saying the church is so worldly and the world is so worldly, nobody knows what's what. It's no, nobody's churchy anymore. Churchiness has somehow gotten a bad rap. I want you to know something. The church is the bride of Christ. It's still in vogue as far as God is concerned. He still adores His church. He still loves His church. He still champions His church. And He's still, listen, building His church. And it is made up of those who are truly walking by faith. Not all who are in Israel are of Israel. And not all who go to church are of the church. Those people are of the church who are walking by faith. Who understand the word of faith. Which means that it is by grace through faith that we're saved. We come to Christ by grace through faith. Faith in Christ alone saves. But faith that saves will never remain alone. Because what you believe impacts how you behave. And if you believe in a Santa Claus God, you're going to believe and behave in a Santa Claus God fashion. He'll give you whatever you want. We have a neat track back there. Well, loving God, let everyone into heaven. It's got the pearly gates and it's got a little depiction of Peter standing there at the pearly gates giving out balloons. <laughs> and it says on his shirt, it says, hi, I'm Pete. <laughs> well, that's what people think. When you read the tract, it says, you know why we believe that? Because it's too scary to think of the alternative. Well, we better start thinking about that because the alternative is serious. He says, they, they, uh, he says the king shall shut their mouth at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see. That means they never had been told clearly what the gospel was. That's what we saw at the fair this past week. People just didn't know. Because nobody had made it clear to them. The girl who was a mime, she got saved. Because nobody told her how to be saved. We told her how to be saved. She got saved. 
But she was a mime. She was a sweet girl, big smile. I, I'm a forgiving person. She, she just felt like that was what it meant to be a Christian. The young man who got saved, he says, well, I've been a good person, tried to keep the Ten Commandments. I try to help people. Whenever anybody needs anything, I'd give them the shirt off my back. That's what I'd do. That's what I'd do. It's not about what you do. It's about what you've done. The things you've done and I've done, the things we've done, the sin. Christ saves without money. He redeems without money. He gave his life for us. That's what they need to be told. That's what we need to be telling them. And the Bible says of those kings, and they, uh, it says they, uh, that, that which they had not heard shall they now consider. You see, the reality is, is our world is in a, a vortex of confusion. And you and I need to be very, very clear in our walk about what the gospel is because we have a whole lot of stuff out there, static, really, that makes none of it make sense. The huge salaries of some of America's preachers, the, the infamy of some of the uh, huge preachers' sins that have been put on display because a person can't fall in a corner anymore because the media will buzz in with lights and cameras and they'll, they'll, they'll shoot it all over the world. Uh, we find all, the, all of this kind of static... And the only thing we can do is say, if the Christian faith has gotten a bad name in the world we live in, you and I have to all the more try to give it a good name. We need to walk with Jesus, love Jesus, follow Jesus, make much of Jesus. And may I say to you, use the name of Jesus. Don't just say God. There's a whole lot of gods. Jesus, only Jesus, is the touchstone. He's the lightning rod. He took our hell. He paid our sin debt. He gives eternal life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but through Him. We need to make much of Jesus. There was a man who was really enthused about his bird watching. And one night he heard an owl in the distance and he began to hoot and try to make some kind of contact. Hoot, hoot, hoot all the time. Became kind of an obsession with him. Pretty soon he noticed the owl started answering him. It was like they were having conversations. He began to catalog all the things that were happening. And subsequently, he was really thinking he was going to make a breakthrough on getting into the mind of the owl. One day his wife was talking to their next door neighbor and she says, you know, all he ever does is he's out there in the backyard. He's just hooting and hooting and this, this, the owl is talking to him. The neighbor lady said, you know what? My husband has been too. We cannot let the world in which we live call the tune because we begin to play off of each other rather than playing off of the off of the sheet music that Jesus has given us. Don't we need Him to be the one who's king now in our lives so that when He's coming, when He comes, He'll be glorified and we shall be glorified in Him? Would you bow with me for a moment?